and or the nursery. Let me uh, direct your attention this morning to the book of Genesis, chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24, looking uh, this morning at verses 50 through 60. The title of our message this morning is Two Choices. I realize some of you probably think I'm a guest speaker today. <laughs> My family and myself having returned from a kind of a Bible lands cruise, retracing the steps of the Apostle Paul and spending uh, three days roughly in Israel. I did uh, feel I was fulfilling a biblical command by going because Paul the Apostle says, I buffet my body. <laughs> and so we did a little of that and more. Uh, my brain is still on Mediterranean time, so I can't guarantee the quality of the sermon today. But I was delighted that there were a total of 11 um, of our large group, 11 Sugarland Church people that went on that trip, Sugarland Bible Church people. So there really is nothing like uh, going to the actual historical places where the biblical events transpired. And all things being equal, uh, we are going again next year, basically the same trip, same time with uh, part of it going to Egypt. I don't know if you've been to Egypt lately. Uh, I've never been. And so if you're interested in that, um, stay alert because I'll give you more details once they become available. I want to thank, of course, Jim and Gabe for so diligently filling in pulpit and Sunday school and Wednesday night Bible study. And it's, um, it's a joy to leave a church for a few weeks and come back and find everything just the way you left it and even better. Amen. So we're talking today about the life of Abraham. We're dealing with this subject entitled Two Choices. We're in a section of the book of Genesis, Genesis 24, where something very special is happening there is a preparation for Isaac's marriage. Abraham and Sarah, as you know, had waited a long time for the birth of Isaac. He was the miracle child born to them in their old age. And Abraham was faithful to the Lord through all of this to the point where when God says, now I want you, Genesis 22, to kill Isaac, Abraham was faithful to that until God stayed Abraham's hand, as you know the story. And God said to Abraham, now I know that you are willing to follow me wholeheartedly. And so further blessings began to accrue into the life of Abraham. And now we're to a point in the story of Abraham. And I should say we're spending a lot of time on Abraham because he is a pivotal and foundational character in the Bible. It is through this man, Abraham, that a nation is being birthed. The nation of Israel through which God has purposed to bless planet Earth through Israel. The Savior, the Scripture, and even the coming kingdom. Three great blessings that God has sought and yet seeks to bring to planet earth would not exist had it not been for God forming the special nation, the nation of Israel. And when God does a work, he typically picks a man or a person through which that work can be accomplished. And that man is Abraham. That's why his story is so carefully traced for us in the book of Genesis. And now we're to a point where we've got to have a bride or wife for his son Isaac 
because if there is no Isaac and Rebekah, then the lineage can't continue. We can't have a Jacob. And if you don't have a Jacob, you don't have the 12 tribes of Israel. And if you don't have the 12 tribes of Israel, you don't have the tribe of Judah. And if you don't have the tribe of Judah, you don't have Jesus Christ. Because Jesus prophetically is going to be born from the tribe of Judah. So this marriage that's coming together here is pivotal. So you can divide chapter 24 up as follows, most of which we've already covered. But Abraham instructs his servant to not get a wife for Isaac from within the land of Canaan, but rather to travel to Haran, which is about 400 miles away up north, to Abraham's original family line to get a wife for Isaac. That's a big job, and so the servant prays, verses 10 through 14, and then God moves his hand like he does and providentially guides the servant to Rebekah, Isaac's future wife. And during that course of time, the servant encounters a man named Laban, who is Rebekah's brother, verses 28 through 49, and God has done a work. And brought Rebekah to Abraham's servant. And now Abraham seeks to bring Rebekah back to the land of Canaan from the land of Haran to marry Isaac. So that the lineage concerning the birth of the nation of Israel can continue. And so we're now in verses 50 through 60 of this uh, historical account where we have the betrothal or the engagement of Isaac and Rebekah. And so those are the verses that we're going to look at this morning. So here is an outline that we're going to seek to follow. And it begins with verses 50 and 51, the consent of Laban and Bethuel. Bethuel is Rebekah's father, Laban is Rebecca's brother. And so notice what it says there in Genesis chapter 24, verses 50 and 51. It says, Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so that we cannot speak to you as bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. It's sort of interesting that the family tree, if you will, of Rebekah is given. Um, Abraham had a brother whose name was Nahor. Nahor had a wife whose name was Milcah. And you see all of this going back to Genesis 11. And Nahor and Milcah had several children. Number eight there is Bethuel who happened to be uh, Rebekah's father. And so the servant has done exactly as he was instructed to do. He did not take a wife for Isaac from amongst the wicked Canaanites, but traveled to Haran to Abraham's family lineage to obtain Rebekah. And it's very interesting that as this servant who could have been, and we don't know this for sure, could have been Eliezer of Damascus, who is mentioned as a high-ranking servant in Abraham's home, going back to Genesis chapter 15. It is interesting that as this servant steps out to do this awesome task of uniting these two people, Isaac and Rebekah, not, not knowing how the plan is going to come into existence, how it's going to be fulfilled, It's interesting how God, the moment the servant stepped out in faith, God provided every single step of the way. That's very significant because many of you, and we just heard from two amazing young women, stepping out in faith to pursue missionary work. One of the things you need to understand is that when you believe God has called you to do something, he is not going to give you 
every detail of the plan ahead of time. If he did that, we wouldn't be walking by faith. We'd be walking by a script. We'd be walking by sight. What God calls us to do is like Peter, who stepped out of the boat on the Sea of Galilee, just being on the Sea of Galilee myself as part of that trip. When Jesus summoned him to come forth, he, Jesus didn't in advance tell him everything that's going to happen. He just said, Peter, I want you to step out and I want you to walk by faith. And Peter actually did a pretty good job of that until he took his eyes off the Lord and onto the wind and the waves. And then he began to sink. The reason this servant's plan has become so successful is he is walking by faith and he is allowing God to fulfill the details. As he is seeking permission from Laban and Bethuel to bring Rebekah back to what later would be the land of Israel, now it's being called the land of Canaan, he didn't know the reaction of Laban and Bethuel. But he just trusted the Lord as he was walking. And you know what? The Lord took care of the details. Now you have the brother's consent to the marriage, and you have the father's consent to the marriage. And the interesting thing about walking with the Lord is you don't have to have every detail worked out from the human perspective. God will take care of that. What you need to do is to obey his voice and walk by faith. It's interesting in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16 and verse 7, it says, when a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he, that's the Lord, causes even his enemies to make peace with him. God has a way of dealing with people and individuals that we think will be obstructionists in carrying out God's plan. We have a tendency to place such a high priority and emphasis upon opponents. And God says, don't worry about the opponents. If you're in my will, I'll take care of the opponents. Where now even Laban and Bethuel both are consenting to something that seems crazy. We're going to take Rebekah away from you and take her back from Haran to the land of Canaan. And as all of this is coming together, what can the servant do other than to give thanks to God? You see a description of that in verse 52. It says, when Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. One of our problems, and I know this for a fact because it happens to be a problem of mine, is when we receive an answer to prayer, we typically have a mindset where we just forget what was answered and we move on in our prayer life to God with the next crisis. You'll notice that this servant is not that way. He took time to thank the Lord. Do we do that in our prayer life? That's a great challenge for us. Is so much of our prayer life crammed with our own needs, that we forget to thank the Lord for the answers that he has already given. There's nothing wrong with uh, coming to the Lord with our needs. We're told in the Bible to do that. But there's also a place in our prayer life to pause for a minute and to thank the Lord for what he has done. And this servant has an attitude of gratitude because of how God has guided this servant to this unique woman Rebecca. It's interesting that as you travel through this, this servant has a mindset of worship. When you go back to verse 26, the servant did the exact same thing. He bowed and gave thanks. You go to verse 48, the servant did the exact same thing. He bowed and he gave thanks. And here we are there in verse 52. And now he's doing it for a third time in this chapter He's bowing and he's giving thanks. And he's not just giving thanks, but he's worshiping. One of the things that we've emphasized as we have sought to study this is the definition of worship. 
worship as much as people want to get bogged down into worship styles and preferences and the worship wars and these kinds of things, we've, we've become so embroiled in those sort of disputes within modern day evangelicalism that our eyes have now been taken off of what worship actually is. There's so much emphasis on style that we forget what worship is. Worship has a very simple definition. It's a response to truth. Jesus in John chapter 4 verse 24 said, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You hear the things of God You're blessed by the things of God. You're touched by the things of God. You see the providential outworking of the plan of God in your life. And the normal response for a Christian is to pause and give thanks for that. And it's also to let one's heart explode into worship unto the Lord. All this stuff about preferences and styles is an important conversation. But let's not forget in the midst of the acrimony what exactly worship is. Worship is something that you can do individually with musical accompaniment or non-musical accompaniment. It has to do more with an attitude of gratitude flowing from the heart where we seek to react in some way to the good hand of God in our lives. I think I'm growing a little bit in this area of thankfulness, having just returned from the Middle East. You really don't appreciate your own country until you leave it for a while, and then you see very quickly the blessings here in the United States of America, things that myself, all of us, have a tendency to take for granted. And even this uh, recent trip back from the Middle East, you know, if we had gone a month earlier, all of the mandates and restrictions in and out of Israel would have applied. I know, for example, one of my pastor friends who took a group there about a month or two months ago and how his group was divided and some of them tested positive for the virus and so Some of them were detained in Israel under sort of a house arrest situation. Others were allowed to go home. And here is myself and my family and our group uh, just going at just the right time. All of those mandates have been removed. Traveling in and out of Israel, in and out of Turkey with no incidents like that whatsoever. How can I do anything other than just praise the Lord for that? That's the, that's the good hand of God. And you, as you walk with the Lord, you'll see that in your life. And I would just exhort you, I would encourage you to take a few moments in your day to praise the Lord. And then the marriage contract, the price is paid. This is common in the Middle East. A price was paid to the father for the hand of the future bride. And you see that there in verse 53. It says, the servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. I hope you can see in this And I think this is the reason, perhaps, why the Holy Spirit has devoted 67 verses to this marriage. I hope you can see in this a pattern of Christ for his church. This isn't a passage dealing specifically with the church. The church didn't exist at this point. The church was a mystery or an unknown truth at the time this story unfolded. But the reality of the situation is our relationship to the Lord is analogized to bride and groom. And just as the servant paid a price for Rebecca's hand, 
Jesus Christ paid a price for you, for me, for all of us to become the bride of Christ, soon to become the wife of Christ. Currently, we are engaged to Christ, and then the marriage is right around the corner. And yet, in the Middle East, before such a marriage could even begin to be thought of, the marriage contract had to be paid. Jesus did the same thing for us by spilling his blood on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20 says, For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. It's a different mindset concerning what I'm to do with this body and my life. I'm to act as if I'm a woman spoken for. That a great price has been paid for me and you, and we should live accordingly. Casey Cunningham was up here earlier during our congregational meeting talking about last year's Vacation Bible School, this year's Vacation Bible School, actually 2023, coming up in the month of June, and having participated in last year's or this year's VBS um, going back to June, I was so delighted with the theme that was picked. Every VBS has a particular theme. The, the theme of this year's VBS was the fact that we are God's special treasure. If you ever doubt your value to God as a Christian, because the world system is always trying to ruin our self-image, our self-esteem, we're, we're whispered to by Satan over and over again that we're, we don't count, we don't, we're not worth much. If you ever doubt your value unto God, all you have to do is to contemplate the price that was paid to gain your salvation. There is no higher price to be paid. And in economics, you ascertain something's value by its price. What was the price that was paid for you? There was no higher price. God the Father gave his only son. This is why 1 Peter 1 and verse 19 says, But with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The prior verse says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of the lamb, unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. There is no more expensive commodity in human history than the blood of Jesus. Nothing, nothing more valuable, nothing more costly, and yet God was willing to spill that so that we could gain a salvation. Your worth to God a value that cannot be calculated. It's inestimable. It's interesting, as you look at verse 33, that this servant is not just paying the marriage contract, but if you look at it very carefully, it says, he also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And a little earlier, it says, and he gave them to Rebecca. Not only did the servant pay value to Rebecca's family for her hand, but he actually paid value to Rebecca herself. And Jesus has done the exact same thing for you. The book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13 says, In him you also listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of the promise. Ephesians 4 verse 30 says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed from the day of redemption. I mean, you are so valuable to God that not only did God 
allow the blood of his son to be shed for us. But he also, just like the servant gave gifts to Rebecca, God has actually given you a gift. It's sort of a, a down payment on the things that are to come. And it's the precious ministry of the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. And so every time you sense internally the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit, the guiding ministry of the Holy Spirit, you look in the Bible and you're understanding something that you didn't understand before, and that's obviously the ministry of the Holy Spirit that's opened your eyes. You just pause and you say, well, praise the Lord. That's my down payment of greater things that are forthcoming. You go down to verse 54 and the servant is partaking and then also making a request. Notice, if you will, verse 54, Genesis 24. It says, then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. How, did you, how do you celebrate in the Middle East? You partake with food. Eating or drinking with somebody is one of the most intimate things that you can do with another human being in the ancient Near East. This is why Jesus, with his disciples in the upper room, had the Last Supper. And you'll find this all over the Bible. Uh, when the nation of Israel entered into the Mosaic Covenant with God at Mount Sinai, it was accompanied by a meal, a celebration. In Western culture, we've sort of lost sight of this because, uh, you know, fast food and all of these kinds of things are now upon us. And we've lost sight of the fact that when you ate with somebody, that was actually a great sign of intimacy. And so there is a place in the life of a Christian to eat and drink and be merry in the sense that you're celebrating what God has done. God is not anti-celebration. The world of legalism will tell you that God is anti-celebration, but your Bible does not say that. In fact, in the book of Exodus chapter 23 and verse 14, as God was laying down the Mosaic law before the children of Israel, he says three times a year, you shall celebrate a feast to me. And I, I am so glad that we are a church that has church-wide meals. I don't say that because I want to further buffet my body, <laughs> although that might be part of it. But I say that because, hey, there's a time for Christians to get together and celebrate and just to you know rejoice in what God has done and, and to fellowship with each other around a common meal. A lot of... A lot of Versions of Christianity will make you feel guilty for that. But I don't think you find that necessarily in the Bible. God is a God of celebration when it's important, when it's appropriate. And I would argue, verse 54, that this servant who has experienced the providential hand of God is in a celebration sort of mode but you'll notice that he doesn't lose his seriousness of his mission in the midst of celebration. The second part of verse 54 says, when they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Celebration is over, and now I want to get back to business. He didn't allow the celebratory emotion to interfere with his severity of his mission. If there's ever a time in Christian history for Christians to be serious about the things of God, I think this would be it. Yes, let's celebrate, but let's not lose fact, sight of the fact that we are on the earth at this particular time in history to fulfill a specific mission from God. The book of Esther says, for such a time as this, I have often complained to God, Lord, I, I'm, I'm not right for this generation. 
My, my values really fit with my dad's generation and my grandfather's generation, and I just feel out of place. I'm always talking about things that the current generation doesn't seem to have an interest in. And then the Lord will remind me that I put you in this generation for a reason. For such a time as this. I mean, you, you might be the only person in your workplace, you might be the only person in your family that thinks the way you do. But God has designed it that way because he knew that you would be needed at this particular time in history. And this servant was needed at this time to, pardon the expression, close the deal on this marriage. I mean, if this, if this deal is not shut, you can't have a nation of Israel. And so the servant never lost sight of that high calling. I'm reminded of what the book of Romans says, chapter 13, verses 11 and 12. It says, do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep. For now salvation, now this is speaking of the third tense of salvation, glorification. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Hey, let, let's live with purpose. And let's live with severity and, and seriousness, pouring ourselves into the things of God, knowing that we are clearly in the last days. If you don't think that we're in the last days right now, um, I, don't, I don't know how much I can help you. To me, you're denying the obvious. I'm not a date setter, nor the son of a date setter. But the spiritual darkness that is coming upon our world and coming upon our nation is a level of spiritual warfare and darkness that I've never seen before. And so if there's a time in history to understand that we are here for a reason and to live in accordance with that principle, not losing sight of it, this would be the time. And this is the attitude and the mindset of this particular servant. You have the servant's request, not the servant's request, but the family's request for a brief delay. You see it there in verse 55. But her brother and her mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, say 10, 10 days. Afterwards, she may go. And you can expect this when you walk with the Lord. You can expect forms of resistance and opposition. You can expect well-meaning people, oftentimes the very people that are closest to you, to try to talk you out of what you're trying to do for Jesus, to try to get you off your game. And a lot of people will say all kinds of things to you and they won't even realize why they're saying it. But we wrestle not against uh, flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of this dark world. There isn't a person in Bible history or Christian history that has accomplished anything for God without persistent criticism and opposition and sometimes pragmatism. I mean, you know, 10 days. Let's just postpone this for 10 days. By the way, what does 10 days mean here? Well, here's the answer. It means 10 days. <laughs> and I, no, nobody looks at this and says, well, each day is an age. This is really about 10 billion years. And I just bring that up because they all do that in Genesis 1. They don't do it in Genesis 24. Well, maybe each you know, of the creation days is some kind of age of time because we've got to fit Darwin into the Bible and all of this kind of stuff. But they don't interpret any other parts of the Bible that way. 10 days is 10 days. 
God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Well, pastor, what does that mean? It means God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh. You don't have to find hidden meanings into things. Unless you're coming to the text trying to rewrite it, as so many people try to do. That's called the accommodation strategy. That's not a perspective that we follow here at Sugarland Bible Church. But why all of a sudden this little protest, ah, let's just postpone this 10 days. Well, one of the pragmatists is Laban. And when you drop back to verse 30, you learn something about Laban's character. This would be Rebecca's brother. When he saw her ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, saying, this is what the man said to me, he went to the man and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. What is Laban actually looking at? He's looking at the money. He's looking at the jewelry. He's looking at the material things that the servant has brought to, from Canaan to Haran. And the text doesn't specifically say this, but this may have something to do with Laban all of a sudden saying, oh, let's just postpone this 10 days. Money does funny things to people, particularly when they're in a position in their life where they're making more of it than they ever have. It's tempting when you're in that position to sort of want to hang on to things. You know, I want to hang on to my house. I like my house. I want to hang on to my car. My, I got two cars. Why do I have two cars? Because I'm an American, right? So that's my constitutional right. I want to hang on to that stuff because I, I enjoy the material blessings. And you have to be very careful with that. Material things are not inherently evil of themselves, but they can start to occupy a place in our heart which is disproportionate. That's why 1 Timothy 6 says, love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. The book of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, and I will never abandon you. Hey, if God is never going to desert me or abandon me, then why is it so easy to get hung up on financial things? Because we want to have enough. We want to have an abundance where I really don't have to depend upon God. I can depend upon myself. And it becomes difficult when all of a sudden you start to acquire things in your life that you've never had before. There's a tendency to want to trust in those things rather than God. You know, Jesus talked about this all of the time. Jesus did not say anything negative about rich people just because they were rich. What he said was, you know, it's hard. And in some cases he said impossible. For the rich to enter the kingdom of God. He said things like to the very wealthy Pharisees. You know the prostitutes. And the tax gatherers. That's the worst of the worst in the land of Israel. They're, they're entering the kingdom before you. I mean why is it so difficult for the rich. To enter the kingdom of God. It's very simple. The rich are sort of used to buying their way out of their problems. I mean, if you have enough money, you can buy yourself out of a lot of trouble. And if you're used to buying your way out of your problems, then you've never really learned to really trust God. And the Bible is very clear that unless you trust Jesus for salvation, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So I very much like what Agur said in the book of Proverbs chapter 30. He said, you know, Lord, don't make me so poor that I have to beg. But at the same time, don't make me so rich that I will no longer seek you. 
or no longer need you. Lord, put me right there in the middle. I think there's a lot of, of wisdom in that. And what you're seeing with this man, Laban, is he's looking at the bracelets and the gold and the metallic articles of great value, is um, there's something going on in his heart in terms of compromise where he doesn't want to see the will of God executed immediately. Let's postpone this 10 days. Maybe he's thinking to himself, maybe I can actually talk her out of going back or maybe I can get my hands on the articles of value, the material things that I am seeing. I mean, why, why did Judas sell out Jesus in the end? It really came down to material things. We know from John 12 that he committed embezzlement over and over again with the little bag that the disciples had with them. Uh, he was upset that Mary had anointed Christ with costly ointment. And he's made the statement there in John 12, you know, this should have been given to the poor. And John adds a parenthetical comment that Judas really didn't care about the poor. What he cared about is more money in the bag, which gave him more opportunity to embezzle. And Judas, of course, was waiting for the kingdom. He wanted a ground floor position in the kingdom which was clearly being offered to first century Israel. And the more that offer was being rejected by the nation's leadership and the kingdom looked like it was going to be in postponement. And the more Jesus began to articulate an interim age where the kingdom will be absent, an age that we're living in right now, by the way, the more Judas became more and more resentful. And so finally he just sold out. If I'm not going to get the kingdom, then the 30 pieces of silver will do. Not even gold, but silver. Um, this is the kind of thing that we need to be on guard against with material things. Don't let material things get in the way of what God has spoken to you and has called you to do. You notice here the servant's rejection of the delay. I mean, this servant is all business. Verse 56, he said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. Look at what God has done to bring the two of us together. Look at the insurmountable odds of somebody leaving Canaan and going up north to Haran 300 or 400 miles and, and meeting the right woman at the right time who is supposed to be the future bride, future wife of Isaac. So the nation of Israel will continue. Look, look at how the, the father is on board. Look at what God has done. Why would I want to slow down the process? I mean, ten, why would I put off God's will for 10 days? And the, so the servant rightfully is not interested in this 10-day delay. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays at wake in vain. I would not have had, he's saying, the success that I have had in putting these parties together had God not been in it. So no, I'm not interested in a 10-day delay. He, he's living here with a sense of urgency. He's on assignment. He's on a mission from God himself. And so... He's not the only one on a mission from God. The Blues Brothers in the movie, they were on a mission from God. You're on a mission from God. God wants you to do certain things. God is moving you in a certain direction. God is providing so that his purpose in your life can be fulfilled. Don't listen to the voice of pragmatism, which is ultimately satanically spawned, designed to slow down your path. 
slow down your progress. Press into the will of God. I can guarantee you this much, folks, that my life would not be where it's at today if I had listened to numerous voices along the path. People very close to me, people that I, conversations that I remember. If I had listened to what they told me to do with my life, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. And it's the same with you. Listen to God. If people want to come and give their commentary on your life, let them do it. But don't let it influence you or persuade you outside of what you know in your heart of hearts is the right thing to do. And this is a tremendous mindset in this servant. And then you come to verses 57 and 58 where Rebecca herself consents to the marriage. This is a big deal. It's as they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. Verse 58, then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Number one, that's an answer to prayer. Because you remember very early on when Abraham was instructing the servant, the servant said, what if she doesn't want to come back to Canaan? And Abraham said, then you are alleviated from your oath. Don't bring her back if she doesn't want to come. Well, very clearly the servant had prayed about this. And Rebecca herself wants to, wants to go from the land of Haran to Canaan. This is actually also more archaeological evidence concerning the fact that the Bible is true. This story, this historical account, took place in that top circle there in Haran. Now, in most of the Middle East, the women are given no choice and no rights whatsoever. So you don't have to ask Rebecca's permission for anything. But it was different in the land of Haran, where this transpired. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says in his Genesis commentary, she was asked, will you go with this man? Normally in the ancient Middle Eastern practices, and obviously it's become worse with the infiltration of Islam all over that region. You know, I am so, do I just let my hair down? I am so sick and tired of modern day feminism telling us that Christianity is destroying women's rights when feminism itself is in cahoots, when the left itself is in cahoots, when progressivism is, is itself in cahoots, when Marxism itself is in cahoots with Islam. Unless a feminist is going to fairly critique what Women's rights are under Islam. I don't want to hear any lectures from them, quite frankly, about how Christianity <laughs> is somehow antithetical to women. The truth of the matter is the figure Jesus Christ did more to emancipate women than any other figure in human history. And all you have to do is to travel to an area of the world where the gospel of Jesus Christ has not penetrated. Like it's penetrated here in America. Where women enjoy rights, making them the envy of the world. Go to somewhere where the gospel has no influence. And you'll see women being reduced to the lowest level possible. What would have been normal here is if they had just taken Rebecca against her will. But this took place in Haran. Arnold Fruchtenbaum says she was asked, will you go with this man? Normally in ancient Middle Eastern practices, the daughter's consent was not required. But under Hurrian law, say that five times fast, that's law in the land of Haran, everything we know about it, from ancient Near Eastern literature, under Hurrian law, which was in effect here, 
The consent of the daughter was required. Her answer was, I will go. Just more evidence that the Bible is recording for you history. The Bible is not contradicting what we know about evidence from Haran and women's rights. It's fitting in perfect harmony with it. And something else while I'm on the subject, because as I'm looking at this, these passages, I'm constantly praying to the Holy Spirit, which direction am I supposed to go with this to your people? What do you, what do you want me to say about this? I mean, who, who, part of me is like, who in the world is even going to be interested in this? And it's interesting how when I pray that way, the Lord has a tendency of taking care of those issues. Amen? This is a picture of our salvation, as I explained earlier. We are the bride of Christ. Christ is the groom. And there is a mindset in the body of Christ that basically says salvation, when it occurs, did not occur because of volition on the part of the saved person. This is an idea which basically says we're regenerated first so that we can believe. They get the order completely backwards. And it's an idea that says lost human beings are so dead in their trespasses and sins, they're like rocks, inanimate objects, and even when they hear the gospel and are convicted by the Holy Spirit of the truth of the gospel, they don't have any ability to respond. And so God has to infuse to them the gift of faith. Well, that's interesting. Who gets the gift of faith? The elect get the gift of faith. Well, what about everyone else that doesn't believe? Well, they never got the gift of faith. Why not? Because they were never elected unto salvation. God passed over them. Well, what's their purpose? Their purpose is to go into hell and to be in hell forever with having never had any opportunity or choice to reverse their circumstances. I mean, you might think this mindset is crazy. This is taught round the clock by some of the most famous, biggest Christian names in the Christian world. It's a doctrine called Calvinism. The type of Calvinism that I'm critiquing here is this aggressive neo-Calvinism which basically says God does everything for salvation and human beings do nothing. You see how this doctrine is refuted by this passage here? That's why I entitled this sermon, Two Choices. Because when you back up to verse 45, excuse me, verse 44, and she will say to me, you drink and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord God has appointed for my master's son. Two choices. God made a choice that Rebecca would be Isaac's wife. Who made that choice? God made that choice. But then you drop down to verses 56 and 57, where Rebecca is not going anywhere unless she agrees. That's the mystery of salvation. God chooses, but when God chooses, he doesn't act as if we have no choice in the matter. I mean, did you choose God or did God choose you? The answer would be yes. That's how God works. I mean, you see it right here. This is a, a prototype, if you will, for salvation history. Does the Bible teach election or does it teach free will? The answer would be yes. You say, well, pastor, you're taking the easy way out. Well, maybe so. But this is above my pay grade, folks. I don't understand this. I mean, to, to, to demand that God explain this to me would be like a grasshopper 
demanding an explanation for Wi-Fi connection. My intellect is so limited. I don't even have the ability to think this way. I just accept the Bible for what it says. It's, it's a, I plead mystery. God chooses, yet we, we choose God. It's like a marriage. I mean, did you choose your wife or did your wife choose you? I hope the answer is yes there. <laughs> or you might need some uh, marital counseling. I love the way Chafer Theological Seminary states this. We say in our doctrinal statement, we believe scripture reveals two clear and indisputable lines of evidence. One line shows God sovereignly choosing his own in Christ. The other shows man possessing the function of volition, able to receive or reject God's ultimately born son. And then they say, or we say, Regarding sovereignty, here are all the verses. Regarding volition, here are all the verses. What we're saying is the Bible teaches both. It's a profound reality. It's a profound mystery. It's inexplicable. Calvinism essentially will major on the sovereignty issue. They'll put all of the emphasis on what God does. Arminianism comes along and it puts all of the emphasis on human responsibility, what we do. And these two sides have been fighting with each other for 500 years. I mean, denominations are formed because of this issue. Church splits and schisms, sadly, happen because of this issue. And yet, what is tragic is at the end of the day, both sides are right. But both lines of evidence are there. Just like a, a marriage. Did you choose your wife or did your wife choose you? The answer is yes. Well, did you choose God or did God choose you? The answer is yes. And anytime you camp on your set of verses and use them like snowballs to throw against the other side, and then the other side is getting their snowballs and throwing them against you, you don't have anything in the body of Christ but dissension and disharmony, which we know is grieving to the Spirit of God. And we're not humble enough to just step back and say, you know what, this is big stuff here. I don't understand this. But God's ways are higher than my own. If God's ways weren't higher than my own, then God wouldn't be God. Do you, do you really want a God that you can completely figure out? I don't know if I'm really even interested in that. Because that means God is no smarter than I am, which would be tragic. You're going to run into these kinds of tensions in the Bible. Just, just, let, them, just let them be tensions. God may say to you, more information will be forthcoming in glorification. But even if he doesn't, accept the fact that God is God and you're not. And rather than trying to figure out what God is doing on his end, why don't we spend our time focusing on what we're supposed to do? We just heard presentations on that, the missions moment. The missions committee at the meeting that took place earlier. Spread the gospel. I don't know how God is doing what he is doing. I don't know if he needs to explain it to me, but I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to preach the gospel to every creature. Two choices, verse 44. Rebecca is appointed. Verses 56 and 57, she completely and totally consents to the marriage. And then you come to verses 59 and 60, where they actually depart for Canaan. It says in verse 59, they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. Notice that Rebecca gets a nurse out of this. Actually, in Genesis 35 and verse 8, her name is Deborah. 
and she is going to become Rebecca's nurse. When you walk in the will of God, provision will always be there. Where God guides, God provides. Acts 28 and verse 10, as Paul was getting ready to complete the final leg of his final missionary activity and get the gospel to Rome, he was in Malta. And as he was leaving Malta for Italy, it says this in Acts 28 verse 10, they also showed us many honors and when we were about to set sail, they supplied us with everything we needed. You don't know how God is going to provide for you. What you do know is that when you're within his will, he will provide. A lot of ministries, unfortunately, present God as if he's down on his last buck. Poor God, how's he going to pull this one off? I guess I have to beg and plead for money. And there's nothing wrong with making financial needs known. But the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, if God is guiding, God is going to provide. You don't know how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. What, what you'll discover as you walk with God is he's pretty creative in how he provides for us. He doesn't always use the same method. But the provision will always be there. And uh, one other fast thing here. You look at verse 60 where we're going to close. It says, they blessed Rebecca and said to her, may our sister become thousands of ten thousands. And may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Now, possessing the gates of those who hate them, that's an outworking of the Abrahamic promises. Charles Ryrie interprets it as you shall possess the gate of their enemies. This anticipates the conquest of Canaan under Joshua, which wouldn't happen for another 400 years, or excuse me, 600 years. But this prophecy would be literally fulfilled in the book of Joshua. They say to Rebecca, may our sister become thousands of tens of thousands. That's an outworking of the Abrahamic Promises where God promised to bless the world through the nation of Israel. And if you don't have an Isaac and Rebekah, you don't have an Israel. And if you don't have an Israel, how could the blessings of God continue to come forth? Genesis 12, verse 3, God originally told Abraham, In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so you see here Rebecca's family praying for these blessings to come upon her, praying for her multiplication. May our sister become thousands of tens of thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. The latter part of the verse will be fulfilled in the book of Joshua. The former part of the verse is evidenced all around us by how God has blessed us through Israel. No Israel, no Bible. No Israel, no Savior. No Israel, no coming kingdom. And the providence and the hand of God is actively involved here. And so we leave this story where we're going to pick it up next time with not just the betrothal of Isaac and Rebekah, but the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah, verses 61 through 67. Transitioning into the gospel here is pretty easy. It's just an invitation to be engaged. You want to be engaged. You want to be engaged to someone that loves you unconditionally. Well, everybody wants that. And how do you get into this engagement? 
you receive what Jesus did for you 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ, through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, bridged a gap that we could not bridge in between our own fallenness and his holiness. That's a problem that can't be fixed. From the human perspective, God fixed it for us. That's what the death of Christ is all about. And now what Jesus commands us to do is to trust in what he has done for us. We cannot save ourselves. There is no human action by which we can save ourselves. The only thing we can do is to receive what he has done as a gift. Much like Rebecca and her family received gifts here. And Isaac is to receive the gift of his wife. He did not go out seeking a wife. He received the gift that God gave him. And that's essentially what the gospel is. That's our exhortation. Anybody in the building, anybody listening online, anybody listening via archive or watching archive after the fact, our exhortation is for you to receive as a gift what Jesus has done. And there's only one way to receive a gift from God. According to Romans 4, verses 4 and 5, it is to believe. John 6, verses 28 and 29, the disciples were asked, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he has sent. Believe is trust. You're trusting in the finished provision of Jesus Christ for your eternity, for your forgiveness, for the safekeeping of your soul. This is not a multi-conditioned offer. There's one condition. But you, through volition, just like Rebecca, have to receive it. The book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 17, says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without cost. If that's not a passage that talks about volition, I don't know if there is a passage. Clearly spells out volition. God has no grandchildren. You can't live off the faith of your parents or your grandparents. You have to become God's child individually by believing the gospel. It's not something that you walk an aisle to receive, join a church to receive, give money to receive, even pray a prayer to receive. It's a condition of the heart where you trust in what Jesus has done. I pray that people everywhere within the sound of my voice would be doing that or understand that right now they have the opportunity to do it, even as I'm speaking. If it's something you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for history, this 4,000-year-old story, and yet it speaks into our lives in the 21st century. I pray that we would walk these things out this week by way of faith. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.